The Fantasy Six Pack Hour. With your hosts, Joe Bob. Ah, you're awful. And AJ Applegar. It's Sin Shu Chu. It's a mouthful. All right, all right. Welcome back to the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. My name is Joe Bond, founder of FantasySixPack.net. With me, as always, AJ Epigarth. What's up, man? It's been what a couple up? weeks. It has been. It has been indeed. Uh, nice little little respite, if you will. Uh, you had your draft last week, so I, did, I, I did. Uh, got got the week off. So that was nice. <laughs> it's all good. I had fun anyway. So, uh, so tonight we're gonna jump into some. <clears throat> excuse me. Jump into some fantasy football best ball strategies but uh let's talk a little news and notes here and obviously the big news is these mlb back and forth with the players association over the contract deals and i'll be honest man like i i never thought i'd say this but like i'm 100 percent siding with the players on this like it's such a joke what the owners are trying to do to them um, yeah, <clears throat> this latest proposal where they're, I finally looked at it a little more closely today. It's like, if you make 500 to a million, you get 70% of your salary. And then it goes down from there, trickles down all the way to the top tier players are going to make 20% of what they made. Yes. Yeah, still a crap ton, right? Like I think they said that trout, right? His high salary, he'd still be making about 19 million this year. Like still a crap ton of money, wow. but it's such a joke. Like what they're trying to do to them, because you know the owners are banking all that TV money, all that you know everything else. Yes, they're losing a ton of money off of the, you know, no ticket sales and no you know, stadium ses- concessions and things like that. But they're still making boatloads of money, and <clears throat> the players have all the risk. The players are going to be the ones catching coronavirus left and right. Cause, <laughs> you know, who knows what they're really putting in place to stop them? But... You know, hopefully not. But right, I mean, they're the ones getting all the risk. So I don't know. It's such a joke what they're trying to do. I guess MLB put a proposal back. The Players Association put a proposal back today, but we'll see what happens there. I, right now, man, I'm not super confident the baseball's coming back after all this. So I don't know. What do you think, man? I dude, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if this is going to be their best pitch, yeah, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, it's it's not a good one, and they really need to change this around and and try to make it work better. Um, I, I don't know. I, I agree with the players too. I think that they just need to hold out and, and do what's best for them. I mean, all of these guys are filthy rich as it is for the most part anyway. So yeah, it sucks not getting, uh, you know, $20 million, but it's <laughs> yeah. cool. I, I, you know, one less yacht in your fleet. I, I think I, some of you guys can handle it. And did you see the thing where like the A's owners is like, Oh yeah, minor league players. We're not playing. We're not paying you anymore. You're done. You're cut off. That's ridiculous too. <laughs> These guys make chump change, dude. Like, give them something. The minor league yeah. players are already severely underpaid. It's so crazy. I don't know, man. It, uh, it sucks. Uh, I, I I get Indeed. pissed off because I really want baseball back, but like, the owners just aren't doing it right. I mean, all the other leagues are just kind of saying like, "Look, let's just continue playing. Let's let's make this happen. Let's make this happen." Baseball's like, "Nah, <laughs> we have to do something different." I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think I think there's a better way to go about this than what we've seen. So I don't know. Hopefully they'll get it figured out. Uh, but I mean, honestly, I'm not as, as much as I miss sports. I almost don't. If that's kind of crazy to say, Shut your mouth, but man. blasphemous. I, <laughs> I don't know. I no, just, go away I, from me. Get off my show. <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't say I miss talking about sports. Uh huh. Well, if we don't That's have sports, right. what are we going to talk about? We're going to make shit up for a while. <laughs> Come on. Probably. Uh, we're good at that. Do do an on-air uh, best of you know something tournament. I'll pass. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get on, I just want to remind everybody, follow us on the YouTube channel. Follow us on Anchor, iTunes, whatever it is that you listen to us on. Follow us, like us. Uh, it, we really appreciate it and uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, but let's... Without further ado, let's bring on our guest this week, Chris Allen from 444 Football, Number Fire, DLF Football. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Chris Allen FFWX. Uh, Chris, you there? 
I'm here, fellas. What's going on? Ah, uh, not what too up? much, man. <clears throat> Living the dream. <laughs> the quarantine dream. Sure. That's what it sounds like. Quarantine <laughs> dream. <laughs> yes. I guess that's what we can call it. <laughs> So, uh, so we've got you on tonight to help us roll through some best ball strategy talk, uh, kind of le- teaching us, teaching everybody else at the same time. We're, we're pretty newbies to best ball. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to pretend on this show. I don't think AJ, you would either. So, uh, Chris, you're, you're going to be dropping the knowledge on all of us. Um, but before we do that, let's let everybody know what we're drinking. Mm, beer. And uh, as the guest, I'll let you go first, man. All right. Uh, well, for folks that don't know, uh, I'm also a home brewer on top of fantasy football being one of my hobbies. So tonight I'm drinking a, uh, a blonde ale that I brewed, uh, I want to say like just three weeks ago. Uh, so it has just a little bit of like banana flavor like to it, banana aroma to it. Uh, along with, I added a bit of vanilla to it as well, uh, just because I've been ex- trying to experiment with adding vanilla flavoring to some beers because the ones that I've had that have that to it, I mean, it's just, it tastes so smooth and so good. I love it. Uh, but I didn't put enough into this particular batch, but it still has uh, just a tiny bit of aroma to it. So that, that's what I'm drinking tonight. So cheers, fellas. Good stuff, awesome, man. Homebrewer. Nice. Cheers to homebrew. Uh, picked a good guest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Um, AJ, what you got? Uh, I have a uh, RAR, R-A-R, R-A-R. Nanocoke yep. Nectar India Pale Ale. I uh, just picked this one up tonight, and um, fairly fairly local out out on the eastern shore on uh, Chop, uh, sorry, Chop Tank River in Cambridge, Maryland. It is uh, so it's it's got some bite to it. It's not super strong. It's only a seven four, um, but yeah, it's it's good. It's a, one I've had plenty of times before uh before tonight so saw it sitting there and figured yeah all right i'll go with this yeah this is definitely a, it's definitely a solid choice um so mine tonight is an aslan beer i've found another one it's cortez and his men it's an ipa it's just one of their standard ipas but man it is it is good. I gave it a four and a half, dude. These are also oh. make some good stuff, dude. If if you can find it near you, it's definitely worth the money. They are expensive, but I mean, it's only seven percent. I mean, not not super high up there, but it's uh, it's just a good solid, like little fruity, but not not too much at the same time. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's I'd buy a lot more of these if I could if they weren't twenty dollars a four pack. <laughs> So, but yeah. kind of like that can art I, i'm i'm jealous yeah yeah dude they, they've got some good stuff man if uh i don't know where you're from chris but if if you can ever find some of this stuff it is it's definitely worth it it's it's one of the high-end beers like huh, i'm this. in ohio we don't really get like we have plenty of decent craft breweries around here and uh i'm pretty close to kentucky so like tri-state area is pretty decent for for home brewing or just like craft brew craft craft brew in general but uh, i'm a sucker for can art i'm not gonna lie yeah. I mean, it could it could be uh, PBR in the can, but as long as that can <laughs> looks good, psh, man, <laughs> I'll, I'll pay that. I'll pay fifteen for that four pack. <laughs> you, you you get a cool picture on there, and mm-hmm. people are buying it. They're like, "Oh man, this is really good." It tastes oh yeah, like dog shit, but this can is <laughs> can is good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, look at this uh, art. That's yeah, funny. that's funny. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's jump into the best ball talk here, and let's just start off basic here. You know, like draft went away and that was a lot of a lot of people's fan you know a lot of fan favorites there um where are you headed or where did you play or you know where are you going to play i guess for most of your best ball leagues this year uh i'm not going to lie to you guys um i started drafting teams in early march uh so as about as soon as the lobbies were open i think they might have been open in late february if i'm not mistaken it or might have been like early march uh but it was about mid-march like when i uh just went full degenerate and started signing up for leagues again and uh to, but to be quite honest uh those are i think those are really for more of like the the industry heads and like the the complete degenerates because i think the edge for drafting early in like March, April, anytime before the draft is kind of a hit or miss thing because you really do have to be, I guess, up on your game regarding 
contract situations regarding incoming rookie class because so much is going to change with both free agency and the NFL draft like going on. I would say for people that are new to best ball drafts, I mean, you're better off waiting until middle of July. Uh, once we're getting into assuming, I mean, fingers crossed so that we're assuming we're getting into uh, training camps and we're getting close to preseason and we have a better idea of how the teams are actually going to look uh, right. in the upcoming season because back I mean when we were drafting in in March and April it was oh okay well there's the Eagles uh, wide receiving core it's it's Alson Jeffrey so he's going to be a value uh, right I mean uh, uh, so oh but wait they drafted Jalen oh okay all right. Oh, Daryl Henderson. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because this season, <laughs> the Rams are going to find up. They're going to feature him now. Oh, they got Cam Akers. Oh, Justice Hill this year. All right. Justice Hill. All right. right. Last year was an absolute fluke. There's no Oh, J.K. Dobbins. Oh, shit. All right. So that that's where yep. some of the some of the issues with drafting early come into play. And uh, I, I don't know how heavy into it that you guys are but I, I do a fair amount of dynasty so some of that overlaps like drafting mm -hmm. earlier in the off season when you're already doing some of that prospect analysis anyway you can start to see some of those values because you're already looking at some of these incoming uh, incoming rookies anyway so if you have that as already one of your i guess skill sets and things that you do uh, for fantasy football you can leverage that and turn some of that into profit when you go to draft your teams like for for best ball that makes sense so that's yeah, just like, like the high level stuff yeah i'm in like yeah. two to three dynasty leagues i think aj you're in about the same um uh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing another uh, well, a couple of startups this year, yep. and then um, nice did uh, uh, second year from from last year. So yeah, and we just it's funny that you talk about Henderson because uh, I don't <laughs> Joe, I don't think I told you yet, but the uh, there was this guy in my one league, and he was just a scourge. Oh, did he try to like, send you Henderson for like Galladay? He, it, yeah, he he offered. I I put a post out on the chat board that Basically just said you know anymore. hey. Looking for running back depth now that I'm, you know, not as quarterback needy. I traded Kamara and some other picks and and got Lamar Jackson. Oh, nice. Um, so nice. I have him and Kyler as like my main quarterbacks. And then I was like, well, now I need running backs. So mm -hmm. put something out. A couple of days later, he he sends me these offers of uh, Jordan Howard for uh, Debo, and then Jordan Howard for someone uh, for uh, Godert, and then. He offers me Henderson for Galladay and Henderson for Kittle. I'm like, dude, what? What are you? What are you doing? I'm like, why are you? Why are you <laughs> no. even sending these out? What is this? And does, it's does like this guy know he what always you like he do? always had some <laughs> long winded diatribe of how to you know how he got to this point, thinking that it was a fair deal, and he's got his rankings and whatever, and all his scouting notes, whatever. It's all nonsense Hard compared good, to what I've seen. That's wow. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. long so, story short, the guy ended up bailing on the league uh, earlier this week because did he really? Yeah, because oh, he man. he was talking to somebody else trying to he he sent like he sends blasts out to every team with like three different offers with one of his players and like a draft pick and somebody else that's better than his player, and it's like, dude, what are you doing? So he wow. sent a bunch of Disley trades out. And a couple of the guys are like, dude, no, like we don't want anything to do with this. Tight ends are garbage, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, cool. Well, my, uh, in my other league, I, I offered, you know, Henderson for, for Kittle. And, you know, it was like the complete opposite. Uh, this guy totally values tight ends. To, <laughs> yeah. Cause it's George Kittle. He's the yeah. freaking tight end in the game. Yeah, oh, arguably man. with between him and Kelsey. That's crazy. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess right, that's why. So, Chris, where so where do you actually play? Like, what site? Uh, I split my time between two sites. Uh, so, Fanball and uh, okay. FFPC, and okay. it's for for two reasons. Because uh, I like to do, I like to build a portfolio uh, when it comes to best ball drafting. And by portfolio, I mean I want to try and get as much exposure to as many different players and at different rates as possible throughout the entirety of the offseason. So okay. if I start drafting in March and I'm going to go all the way up until the first kickoff in, again, hopefully in September, uh, I want to try and get as much exposure as I possibly can to players because I know that I'm not all that great 
when it comes to predicting the outcomes of the fantasy season. But I do know that if I, uh, with as much research as I do throughout the off season, I can get a pretty good gauge. So let's say, for instance, if I believe that look, this is probably this is an easy one. DJ Moore is a good wide receiver. I also think that one in being in good, a good wide receiver, he's also in a good situation. Teddy Bridgewater likes to throw short of the sticks or has a uh, has a lower a dot. Their defense isn't going to be all that great, even though they spent like all of their draft picks on them this season. I mean, it's just to me, it sets up that they're going to be in a bunch of negative game scripts. Who's going to benefit from that? A guy like DJ Moore. Yeah, so that's no, fine. That's good. I will continue to draft somebody like DJ Moore. And if I'm assuming that the that the field that I'm drafting against is going to have, let's say, 10 to 15 percent exposure to DJ Moore, I want to be ahead of that. All, out of all my drafts, I want to have 15 to 20 percent. So that's that's where you want to try and set your how much you want to expose yourself to specific players. But I, I don't think there's a player that I've I can think of that I want zero exposure to. I mean, I've even drafted a guy like Antonio Brown in one or two leagues, yeah, just in the off chance of course. that if he does get reinstated, he is one of those guys that should immediately be able to outkick his value because you can get him at the very end of your draft. So yeah. it's possible. That's where you kind of have to play those what if scenarios at the back end of drafts and try and swing for the fences. Absolutely. Josh Gordon, Deshaun Jackson coming back from injury, all of those guys. I mean, you have to kind of tell you tell yourself the story of what the 2020 season is going to look like. And if we know if we learn anything from any fantasy football season, literally ever, you never know at the beginning of the season, you never know. And it's going to be a complete roller coaster ride. So why not try and get ahead of ahead of that by drafting some of those guys that if this were if X were to happen, then Y guy winds up being the beneficiary of that. So that's so, what best ball you should try and capture that in best ball leagues. So I've got a I've got a I've got a, a question, a follow up question to what you just said. But I do want to ask you though, like I know every site's slightly different. So let's just focus on fanball and FFPC. Like what's the difference here? I I think FFPC does like their is it called cut line or something like that for or they do baseball. for some of them uh but for just their even their traditional uh best ball leagues uh there are two main differences between what you'll see on ffpc and what you'll see on fanball okay. one is the cost uh minimum cost for at ffpc is 35 dollars to get into a single uh a single best ball league mm -hmm. over at fanball minimum at least traditionally it's, it was like 10 bucks so if you don't want to put a ton of your bankroll in you want to get like, you know, maybe do 10 drafts or something like that. You're only out a hundred bucks. So at Fanball, that's that you have the cheaper cost. But also the main difference or the uh, two other big differences between Fanball and FFPC is the scoring. FFPC has tight end premium leagues. That's mm -hmm. traditionally how they've how they've run. So when it comes to tight ends, I mean, all of those guys that we were talking about earlier, when you guys mentioned like Kelsey yeah. or Kittle and any of those, I mean, those guys are going in like the first and second round. Wow. Uh, Mark Andrews is going at like the two, three turn. Uh, I mean, Zach Hertz is going around like the third, the third, fourth round. I mean, wow. it's just those. I mean, because of the 1.5 PPR for tight ends, all of those guys get pushed up. I mean, you're going to see Noah Fant, uh, TJ Hawkinson. Uh, I mean, Mike Gusecki. I mean, all of those guys are going by like the eighth or ninth round. I mean, all of them. You're going to see like probably 12 tight ends taken before the eighth round. So, I mean, there's that. And then also uh, FFP, FFPC also includes kickers as well. And so it's 28 rounds. Mm -hmm. So you're one, you're getting deep into rosters, running backs and wide receivers, but also they take in kickers as well. So it adds in another element to your game where you have to now try and tell yourself the story of, well, what type of game script are some of these uh, teams going to be in? So do you want to invest early in a team like, or the kicker for a team like, uh, let's say Seattle or like traditionally being the Patriots or I mean, so though, I mean, even Baltimore. So if you want to get Justin Tucker early, right. Harrison Butker for the Kansas city. So kickers attached to good offenses. So that's another layer of complexity that you have to account for. Like when you're drafting some of those at FFPC with fanball, it's just the only additional uh, roster spot goes to defense. So it's just, it's a little bit easier to plan for. Interesting. Interesting. All right, so my follow-up is you started talking about, you know, swinging for the fences on a few guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, let's take out the fact that you probably play in 100 times more leagues than I do if I were to play. <laughs> I, I don't um, tell my wife that. <clears throat> so 
if I play right, leagues. It's what are you be, talking it's about? Gonna yeah, of course. <laughs> it's going to be a handful of leagues, so I can't, like, I don't have a portfolio of players. Like, I'm kind of, I'm just trying to build the best team that can everywhere. So mm-hmm. take that into account. And that, I think that's the majority of people out there. Um, how, like, how risky should you be in drafts? I know ceiling is, is cool, but, like, being safe is also, like, part of it as well. Absolutely. And it depends on, uh, so there's, I guess, one one or two things to take into account there when you're talking about swinging for upside. So when you're swinging for upside, I mean, you're trying to, I guess, draft a guy either mid to late that you think could wind up hitting or at least like severely outkicking their, their ADP. So let's take an instance for a guy like that I see going like fairly late into drafts, which I don't really understand. will be a guy like, let's say, Marvin Jones. So Marvin Jones at this point, if I'm not mistaken, he's going as the, and I have ADP pulled up, Marvin Jones is going as the wide receiver 43 in so FFPC, like FFPC normal, best ball draft, yeah. wow. which is really late. But we know what mm. Marvin Jones is capable of. So if you have any concerns about, let's say, Matt Stafford's injury, if you have any concerns about what their pass-to-run ratio is going to be now that they've drafted another another running back to go alongside of on Johnson, here the risk to me is not really is not more so than the reward of a guy that at the very least walks into the wide receiver two position alongside a great receiver in Kenny Galladay. So to me, it's like that's to me that's a slam dunk. That's a value to me. So while he is going later in drafts, you can immediately tell yourself a story about, well, even if he does get injured again, because that's obviously a risk that's a uh, that becomes a part of his player profile. He is older in age. That's another thing. So we don't know if he's going to like fall off the cliff because of, because of his age. Mm-hmm. It's just to me, it's because if he's a part of a good offense with a gunslinger type quarterback. He is somebody that you would want to try and draft along in your team. But on top of that, who else have you drafted before him? Who else is on your team? Do you have wide receivers ahead of him on your team like, let's say, a couple of slot receivers? Let's say if you have a guy like Sterling Shepard or Jarvis Landry like sitting alongside him. Do you have guys that ahead of him as well that are guaranteed like large target shares? Have you drafted a guy like Allen Robinson, Tyreek Hill, Julio Jones to go alongside him? Mm -hmm. So even if he does wind up having those boom weeks, there's going to be there's going to be valleys in between those peaks. So you need to be able to complement your roster with wide receivers that can offset some of those valleys. And so that's where that risk has to be, uh, I guess, accounted for when you draft guys like that. So do you generally, and I, and I know this may be a terrible question, but do you generally draft more like, and it's weird to say safety up top, like in early in the drafts because those guys are obviously like the better players, but like, do you try to mm-hmm. get more safety up top or do you try to go a little high end? Like I even kind of say Tyreek Hill is a little risky at times because he does have those like early, like he's so good. He, he overall, he's going to balance out to be like number no worse than like number five, number six receiver. It feels like, but I feel mm-hmm. like he's got those games here and there where it's just like, where'd he go? Like he's sort of risky. My point in, in, in my book, but, um, there's other guys that are up there too, the same way. Um, Mike Evans has done that time and time again, right? He doesn't score a couple mm-hmm. touchdowns sometimes. He's just like nowhere. Um, do you draft more safety up front so that you can maybe take higher chances in the back, like a Marvin Jones or a Djax or something like that, or do you just kind of take what comes to you? Uh, in at least for wide receivers, because both Fanball FFPC, I can't think of a best ball platform that doesn't have PPR scoring. Mm-hmm. So because the scoring automatically favors the wide receiver position, mm-hmm. I would at least want to walk away out of the first four to six rounds with at least two solid wide receivers. Okay. So by two solid wide receivers, I'm thinking if I can get one within the first, let's say, two to three rounds. So we're talking like uh, if I can get a guy like Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, cool, I'm set. I don't have to worry about it. But if the, I even have to fall back and get a guy like, let's say, Oda Beckham, which I can tell myself a story as to how he at least has a resurgence in 2020. Or if we're talking about Cortland Sutton, another year uh, in Denver, uh, Drew Locke wasn't terrible, but he should be the alpha, even if they drafted Jerry Judy. I mean, I can tell myself a story about that guy. Sure. Allen Robinson, another guy, uh, yeah. alpha in his in, uh, in his uh, offense. So if you're walking out of your first four or five picks with wide receivers like that, 
then you can wind up complement them with guys like we were talking, like a Marvin Jones. Uh, Deontay Johnson is another guy who's starting to catch some hype, uh, has a higher A dot, wide receiver two, maybe three in his offense. Uh, I mean, assuming Big Ben is there, but has some risk associated with him as well. So like while there are a number of safer options, you still want to capture number like wide receiver one types as soon as possible in the in your draft because again with that ppr scoring you want at least be want to be able to capture as much of a target share of that offense as possible sure makes sense makes sense all right so let's uh let's dive into the the meat of uh what we're looking at here and just go position by position um so best ball quarterbacks uh, we, we we have basically a four questions for each one of the positions that we'll kind of rip through and you know uh go from there so first question we were looking at here is how many quarterbacks do you prefer to draft uh depending on the site so if i'm looking at fanball i would say two to three and that's just dependent on when i take them uh so let's say for fanball specifically if i wind up drafting uh let's say uh, a qb1 uh let's say one of the first like five or six quarterbacks that come off the board so lamar jackson patrick mahomes uh, even up to Dak prescott i would say uh, I probably will just stick with them and then find one more quarterback, let's say in the QB 10 to 15 range that I can offset their bye week and then I should be okay. Uh, if I wait a little bit longer and let's say I start with a guy like Matt Ryan or Carson Wentz as my QB one QB two, and then I wait and then I would probably wind up grab another mid tier quarterback. And then I would get a third quarterback with some upside. So like a Teddy Bridgewater that I can wind up having three quarterbacks that I could probably cobble together uh, a top end quarterback, like throughout the entire season. Uh, with FFPC, because it's 28 rounds, you're going a little bit deeper into rosters. You can probably wind up drafting a minimum of three, depending on where you draft them. So if you wait a little bit later and you try and do that late round quarterback strategy, I can see you going with four, but I would say a minimum of three over at FFPC. So yeah, that's a good good segue into the next question: Is when do you like to draft them? Um, so, uh, when really, do you, when do it, you typically look at your quarterbacks? Me, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I guess I might be kind of biased because, like, I've been I have been the uh, I've lived the stream. Uh, you know, as JJ Zacharyson likes to likes to say, uh, worked with him. I'm actually a consultant. I work for Denny Carter. Uh, so I've just kind of been around that mindset of always trying to find value on the waiver wire or wait until I like the last possible minute in order to harvest as much value out of the position as possible. Uh, but now it just to me, it feels like if I don't walk out of my draft with getting a guy like at minimum, uh, a Carson Wentz, a Matt Ryan, um, I've reached for Dak Prescott a couple of times because I really like their offense this season. Uh, I just feel like my my team is lacking, at least in that respect. So I, I will try and reach for at least getting my first quarterback in the six to 10 range. Uh, I haven't brought myself to draft Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes yet. I feel they're still going a bit too early in most drafts I've been a part of. But then after that, looking at my QB2, like I said, in the QB10 to 12 ish range, because most of my research has shown that uh, if most of the most of the quarterbacks that hit and that wind up actually out kicking uh, their quarterback ranking preseason uh they have uh the, those are they have the the highest chance in order to get into that top five range those guys that we draft in the 10 12 13 range they've uh, actually wound up getting into the quarterback five range like at, at the end of the season so like lamar jackson in the year past uh, Dak prescott himself he actually did that this past season patrick mahomes beforehand uh so those guys they had you know later round quarterback value and then we just want we saw them take over the league by storm after that so that's typically where i like to draft my quarterbacks okay um what about sleepers you know and and value guys like who are who are a couple of guys this year you mentioned lamar last year uh well i guess two years ago mm -hmm. um and then well i guess really coming into last year actually yeah yeah so who who do you like this year is is kind of that that mold of somebody that that could surprise us and and jump up uh it's definitely going to be biased uh and i already know this and that's but don't hate me for it but i live in ohio and i'm in i'm semi ex uh, Bengals fan so i will say that i, I kind of like joe burrow uh i 
uh, I didn't dig into my prospect evaluation like super early uh, this this year, but I did wind up watching the title game like most of us did. And mm -hmm. it was just I was really excited to see at least the, the way that the offense was run. I'm excited to see like what he can uh, how he meshes well with Zach Taylor. Uh, Cincinnati had one of the, the highest passing rates in the league for the, the first four weeks. Mm -hmm. Things kind of petered out like uh, throughout the middle of the season. Once Dalton went down, uh, they had to switch to, I think it was like Ryan Finley for a hot yep. second. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I'm thinking that with the way that Zach Taylor has shown he wants to run that offense, I think he should pair really well with a guy like Joe Burrow. You got A.J. Green. They draft T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd in the slot, Joe Mixon out of the backfield. Uh, so I think, and also Burrow, like he has some juice with his legs. We've seen him, you know, not necessarily on designed runs, but he can run when he needs to. So a guy like him, as soon, assuming you can still get him late, which again, he falls into that quarterback 20 plus in most yeah. of the drafts I've seen him. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind like drafting him and kind of see how the season, uh, the season goes. I mean, of course they play in the AFC North. They're going to wind up playing brutal defenses like Pittsburgh. Cleveland, Baltimore. I mean, all those guys are in their division. So mm. I, I can see them having some down games, but it's just to me, with the way that offense is structured, they're they're going to be passing. I mean, that they, they almost have to be between that offensive line and the weapons that they have around them. So between him and also I mentioned him earlier, uh, Teddy Bridgewater. I did a piece on Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, if, if it wasn't last month, it was the month beforehand. Check that out over at 4 for 4, uh, where I showed for his uh, five five starts when he took over for, for Drew Brees, uh, he wasn't like that statistically different than Drew Brees in most of the categories where we want to see them excel. Uh, the short to intermediate areas of the field, like he was he was pretty good. Uh, it was just his problem was the deep ball, but Drew Brees also has issues with the deep ball, uh, but also the uh, issues in the red zone, which we really want to see more of. And I think that given the fact that he was asked to kind of come in uh, as an emergency, uh, I think that was more of the reason why he had most of those issues. But also he was playing against some of the tougher defenses. I think they had to play against both Chicago and Minnesota, like during that five game stretch. So mm -hmm. I, I can give him some leeway there. And so now if he's put in a situation where he's playing with DJ Moore, uh, Ian Thomas is coming along. He's got Christian McCaffrey. They add Robbie Anderson. Curtis Samuel's still there. I mean, he has oh much more playmakers than he had in new Orleans where it was just That's Michael true. Thomas, Jared cook. I think Alvin Kamara was down for a couple of games, like during that five game ish stretch. So it's just, uh, yeah, I, he, he was just kind of down in general last year. I felt like we still finished strong you yeah. know, overall, but you know, owning him, I, I had a lot of, a lot of shares of him last year and I was kind of disappointed overall. Me too. Yeah. I was almost happier being able to snag Latavius Murray off the waiver wire and watch him like, you know, run in for a 20 yard touchdown every oh, now yeah, and again. But that's yeah. my point. I, I can see a guy like Teddy Bridgewater kind of eking his way into, I'm not saying he's going to be a top 12 quarterback, but I do see him like, again, if he's being drafted as QB 21, 22, can I see him finishing the season as QB 14, 15? I think that's well within his range of outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. One guy that kind of interests me, and I want to get your thoughts on him is Philip Rivers. Hey, I, all right. So that's, now we're talking here, but now see the, my, my issue with Philip Rivers, is he going to be throwing those yellow balls and having like those right. fourth quarter meltdowns, you know, and, and having to kind of pull himself out of the hole he digs for himself, like earlier on in the, in the game. I'm still remembering that was it, it was either a Thursday or Sunday night game where they played against uh, the chiefs, or that might've been a Monday night game where it was, I think he had three or four interceptions. He had one where he was he threw the ball deep to Mike Williams that got intercepted. I think one got tipped on a pass to Keenan Allen, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Uh, Hunter Henry scored a touchdown because I remember I'd rostered him for that particular yeah, game. Nice. <laughs> uh, but either way, I mean, that's where if he can clean up the, the YOLO balls, which I think in that offense, he won't have too many options for that. I think it's more of he plays within the structure. T.Y. Uh -huh. Hilton is still there. I'm assuming Paris Campbell is going to be a bigger part of that offense. And now with their so. addition of Jonathan Taylor and Marlon Mack, that ground game is really going to help. Yeah. And also, we have to give credit to the fact that they have one of the best offensive lines yes. in the league. Yeah. So if he has Absolutely. that time, if he has that time yeah. to process, he has that time to really ferret out like what's going on with defensive coverages, then I think he'll be able to actually use his weapons. Naheem Hines, I'm hoping. Uh, we'll also be able to take a take a step forward and we can see more of Philip Rivers. So yeah, he's also a good target in yeah, that I, yeah, quarterback 16, 17, somewhere in there. Hey, dude, I'm I mean, granted, I just ripped up I just pulled up 
Fantasy Pros best ball rankings, and I have no idea whose rankings I'm looking at here when when the consensus is up here, but it's 23, and I'm sitting here like that's oh like, see that's I take yeah so I take him ahead of that all <laughs> day yeah, <me> too. <laughs> all day this year. I mean I yeah the combination of Frank Reich and the offensive line in general mm-hmm. just makes mm-hmm. me want to go after Philip Rivers as a late you know late mm-hmm. target even in redraft leagues this year. I'm just like you know what. If I get a Carson Wentz or somebody like that as my first quarterback, I'll take a stab at Philip Rivers. Why the hell not? <laughs> you know exactly with who he's throwing it to. I yeah, mean, you have got a great. You have so many cast. reliable players that uh, that he have as options. Why not take a shot and see if that change in that offensive line is just what he needs? And I think that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, and that's you know brings me to a good point here that I, I wanted to mention. Um, you know, and looking through your your article on uh, best ball roster construction, and just seeing your the stats in in there about the quarterbacks, how last year fifty eight different quarterbacks started a game for their teams, uh, and seventy three of them recorded in game stats during the season, mm-hmm. and it, it seemed like it was a crazy year for injuries. You had Mahomes, yes. you know, yes. missing some time, Breeze missed some time that we talked about. Roethlisberger and... missed basically the entire season because he was absolute trash in that first game. Yep. Um, but just seeing that that breakdown, that it really wasn't that much different from what's happened in 18 and 17 and 16 and 15, where he had 55 starting with 74 recording stats in 18, 56 to 75, 54, 73, 53, 76. Wow, uh, you know, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen. I mean, it's right in line with that. Mm-hmm. So but just, it felt different, it though, felt, right? It did feel. It different. did. Maybe it, it yeah, that, always like, does. I wonder if it just felt I, different because, like, it was the starters that went down for multiple games, mm-hmm. and it was many, many starters that went down for multiple games. And so, like, yeah. you're, when you're talking about like 55 started and 74 recorded stats, you're talking like second stringers that started and the third stringers came in and replaced. It's like it wasn't right. the opposite a bunch of times. Maybe that's more what it was. And mm-hmm. like the starters just missed so many games this year. Yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if you get like so. the first, the, I'd like to, I would love to see a stat to see how many games the, the start, like the opening day starter missed per year. Mm. Yeah. I'd have to take a look at that. that that'd be interesting to know. Cause yeah, yeah I mean, it's okay. Well, 73 different quarterbacks really recorded <laughs> in game stats. <clears throat> You know that you got Taysom Hill is probably one of those seventy three, and how many in game stats did he record? You know, right? True. Random he gadget plays. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> Robert know. Griffin coming into salt away games while yeah, Lamar's exactly. The bench. Yeah. So some of that is kind of is kind of uh, yeah. you know just just off. Um, so. But it, it leads me into the last question here of fades. Like, uh, who are you looking at as a fade this year, and and is it? somehow you know or possibly tied in with injury guys or not no i think what well, one guy that i'm not necessarily fading it's just hard for me to draft him even when like i see him in the let's say around the 15 quarterback 15 16 range uh is it's jared goff i mean i, I like his pieces don't get me wrong i mean i've been drafting uh robert woods as much as i possibly can uh, I'm iffy on Cooper Cup, but I like what he what we saw down the stretch uh, last season. Tyler Higby, Gerald Everett. Uh, I, I like most of the pass catchers, but Jared Goff by himself, I mean, one, he's not going to get you anything with his legs. I mean, we've seen he's more of those statuesque like pocket passers. But I mean, I think last season it like really accentuated the fact that uh, once he got pressured, we saw just wild splits in his accuracy. Like once the uh, once any defensive front was able to break through that offensive line, and if we still have questions about that offensive line, uh, I can't see myself going out and drafting him when I could wait a little bit longer and grab a guy like uh, Ryan Tannehill who's going after him, or I can grab a guy like Ben Roethlisberger who we know. I mean, assuming he's healthy, he like his pass catchers and his ability to put points up on the board are much greater than Jared Goff's. If you want to, again, like we were talking about, some of those guys that are coming even later that might have some upside, it's just while I'm not saying he's a full fade for me, it's hard for me to draft him at his current price because I at least can tell myself a story about guys going behind him that have the ability to at least meet his production or exceed it. Okay. That's a good guy's there. I like that. 
All right, well, let's jump into some running backs here. Um, So, again, same questions as AJ alluded to. Uh, We just kind of run through the general strategy for for the position. You know, just going into it, how many do you prefer to draft for running backs? Okay. Uh, For for fan ball, I normally try and keep it around the about five. Uh, And, again, it – I might go less than that or more than that, depending on when they're drafted. So let's say, and this is typically uh, that's that's guided by where you sit at, like in your in your draft slot. Because let's say if you're drafting in the first four or five picks, I mean you're you're getting one of the RB ones, right? You're getting mm-hmm. your Kamars, you're getting your Zeeks, you're getting your CMCs, you're getting your Saquons. So you're right. starting off already with a, a, a good running back to start with. And then depending on what comes back to you in the second round, you might wind up with uh, probably not now because like ADP has shifted so much. But let's say if you were to wind up with, let's say, a Josh Jacobs, he falls all the way until like the back end of the second round. Um, Miles Sanders, not even an option pretty much, or maybe not, not Joe Mixon either. I'm trying to think of who else like might fall. Maybe Austin Eckler. Maybe that's even a stretch. Yeah. But starting off like with a number of running backs like earlier in the draft, that would also that would drive me to pivot to other positions later because I know I have a number of touches already lined up at the running back position because of the capital I spent earlier. Similar with FFPC, but because you have more rounds, I'm going to draft maybe one or two more guys past that. So instead of the four, five, six that I would get at Fanball, I'm mm-hmm. talk, probably looking at six, seven, or eight over on FFPC. Okay. Now that's good to know. Uh, and then. Just moving forward with this here. So, you know, you kind of talked about your wide receiver draft strategy early on, how you like to go heavy early with receivers generally because it's all PPR. But when – so with that in mind, when do you really like to draft your running backs? And I know it is draft position, you know, depends a little bit. But let's just kind of generalize it as best as we can. Sure. And if I can get early – running backs early – uh, they need to fit a certain profile. Like they need to one be the let's say at least the sixty percent starter. I mean, I'm depending on draft slot. I'm not going to get a true bell cow, right? I'm right. if if I don't have the first four or five picks, I'm not going to get my Kamara, my CMC. Like I'm not going to get those guys. Yeah. But if I can get a Joe Mixon, if I can get a Miles Sanders, if I can get an Austin Eckler, I can start there and I can build from there. Because one, I, at least I'm I'm working under the assumption that they're going to have the most uh, touch volume within their within the running back group, but also they're involved in the pass game. Those are the two things that I'm looking for within the first three to four rounds. Like, are they going to have a significant touch share in their volume, and are they a part of the passing game? If I if I can say yes to both of those things, I'm probably going to try and grab them. I mean, the only guy that really doesn't fit that mold is Derrick Henry, and that's and, but we know what Derrick Henry is capable of. So he's like the only like anomaly at this point, but everybody else, uh, Nick Chubb, Josh Jacobs, most of those guys, you can tell yourself a story as to how they have 60% of the running back share in their, uh, in their particular offense, a part of the passing game doesn't have to be significant, but at least if it, if they are getting some targets per game or they can wind up with catching 20, 30, 40 balls within a season, great and those are the guys that i want to try and aim for uh in the early stages in the middle to late stages it's about upside I mean, you're really trying you're really walking yourself down narrative street uh, especially when it comes to rookies rookie running backs they have the higher hit rate than uh than rookie wide receivers because of wide receivers so much more goes into understanding the position you have to be in tune with the offense you have to understand how to actually you're developing as a wide receiver at the professional level you have to have rapport with the quarterback so much more goes into wide rookie wide receivers than it does running backs it's just stuff the ball in his belly and you just run up the gut but uh so for running backs it's easier for me to say well do i want to invest in a guy like clyde edwards hilaire I mean, he was drafted in the first round. He's now going to be uh, either catching passes or taking handoffs from Patrick Mahomes. But now he's his ADP has just like gone completely uh, through the it's roof. Bonkers, it's, in my opinion. Oh yeah, he's going in the second round. I've seen some people take him in the first round. It's ridiculous. Everybody wants Kareem Hunt from two years ago. Exactly. So uh, good luck. Guys. So <laughs> yeah, 
but there are, are but with running backs being so much of people's early round strategies it's hard for you to really get value there right. i mean unless you're just completely pounding running backs in the first like three to four rounds it's hard for you to get value so you have to look at the middle rounds you have to look at guys like like we were talking about earlier daryl henderson do you think that he might be able to eke out some you know something of that running back touch share I don't know. I mean, J.K. Dobbins, uh, if you want to even go farther back than that, uh, guys like David Montgomery, go even farther back. Yeah. Guys like Alexander Madison. I mean, Ronald Jones, Jordan Howard, Matt where's, Breida. Where's somebody like Darius, Darius Geis going who's been like super injury prone, but like you see talented, right? He's like my, he's one of like he's like my kryptonite. So Darius Geis so is going good. as running back 33 right now. <clears throat> right around Damien Williams, Marlon Mack, like in that range, Ooh, which geez, really. to me, that's not a bad price. I guess I've seen him play three games. So, okay, we'll see. Right. We saw, <laughs> saw flashes and I, I was given some hope towards the back end of last season, yeah, but now they've added so again. much. I mean, they have what? Seven running backs, I think no, on their roster right now. Sticking, but you know, you got to imagine you know, I'm a Redskins fan. Sadly, but uh, uh, it's it's one of those things where I feel like they they gotta give Geist the chance, you know, mm -hmm. to see if he can stay healthy. But yeah, it's 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 tough, man. It's it's tough to blow even a what Mac and them sixth round, sixth, like it's about round sixth seventh round. It's tough to blow a six round pick on a complete wild card because you have no idea. Right. And I think that because now the new hotness is the uh, the back they drafted this year. Right. Was it Antonio Gibson? Like everybody, everybody wants a piece of him now. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, know. I know guys that are I mean, they won't leave their draft unless they get Antonio Gibson. Hmm. And it's just it's hard. I mean, with as crowded as that backfield is. But I mean, if if you want to if you want to draft for upside at that point. I mean, who do you think has uh, who who do you think is has the better talent if you're looking at guys that are going around him? Is it Darius Geis or is it Carry on Johnson? I mean <laughs> Geis. <laughs> Geis, that's easy. Talented but I mean, easy, but uh, yes, talent's the easy the thing. But, well, both right. like staying on the field, but <laughs> yeah. that that's the question. Yeah. That, and that's what you're constantly having yeah. to ask yourself, that's... like once you get into like that tier of running yeah, backs. Like absolutely. once you get into like around the eighth round, you're you're kind of grimacing as you click draft this guy. But you can at least uh, hopefully you're telling yourself a story of all right, well, I mean Ron Rivera, it's his first year. He's not tied to guys, but did, would he want to see what they saw and what the previous regime saw on him and get him out there? And, you know, if, if Dwayne Haskins, like, had some rapport with him, he was better with him than Adrian Peterson, then maybe they give him a shot. Sure. I don't know. It, yeah. We can walk down that narrative street. Yeah, it's absolutely. possible. So let's jump right into that. You started talking about sleepers and values there. So let's just jump right into that. Give us a couple of sleepers slash values. Uh, for me, values in the middle rounds. I'm I, I'm I'm a sucker for Damian Williams. I don't even care. I mean, draft Clyde Edwards, draft Clyde Edwards Hilaire at the like the 101 in the NFL draft. I don't even care if he went first overall. Damian Williams was the MVP of that Super Bowl. I don't care what you guys say, and I will continue to draft him now that he's his value has dropped because uh, even with the injury concerns, I think pre-draft he was around the fourth fifth round. And now you can have him in the fifth, sixth round, and he's still there. He can still run a nasty wheel route. I mean, we saw what he did in the Super Bowl. Dude, I'm yeah. probably still going to draft him. I'm, I'm with you there on that one, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take him all day. Uh, other guys that I'm looking at, uh, Boston Scott for the Eagles. Uh, I mean, even with them sign, who did they just, what vet did they pick up? Carlos Hine? No. no, no, no. He went the to Eagles. the Seahawks. They're, well, they're thinking so about getting Devonta Freeman. That's what it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. right? it happened? But still, did I miss that? I don't. I haven't heard anything. If it has, yeah, I didn't think was, that's it's happened huge. yet. Huge. They like the rumor is they've offered him a contract. That's right. Yeah. But still, me I mean, because... we saw what Boston Scott was able to do last season. Yeah. I mean, just even as not just as a receiver, but in the games where Miles Sanders was dealing with his like foot and ankle uh, injuries, like during the last like three or four games. I mean, Boston mm -hmm. Scott was actually a pretty good runner, like inside yes. runner. I mean, he did his best Darren like Sproles impression. He just never got his chance. It felt like. Yeah, I, I thought he was great. Like you know, trying to you know revive the the legend that is Darren Sproles, and mm -hmm. I think that 
considering the Eagles did not go, did not come out of the draft with another running back with significant draft capital. The only thing they're doing is kicking the tires on some of these older vets. To me, that signals that they're fine with using them as a one, two punch. And then they can supplement that with a vet, but Boston Scott with where he's going right now, he can be had in the probably 10th, 11th round. So you're talking about your RB five somewhere in there. I wouldn't mind having that. I mean, especially again, it's PPR. So you're taking advantage of both the receptions and those possible production on the ground. I'll take that all day. Yeah. And I I think a big thing with his game last year was definitely him out of the backfield. Um, Part of that was due to the fact that they had no wide receivers. So I I think that that's, uh, you know, that could take a a small backseat this year. Well, assuming that the receivers stay healthy, but (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I still think he he's he's shown his value in that that facet of the game. So I, 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 like Scott. I, I hope so. I mean, and for as pass happy as the Eagles are, I mean, they were they're passing at uh, about 61 percent in neutral game scripts. So for that, I think that was like 10th or 11th in the league. And uh, if we're assuming that that's going to continue under Carson Wentz, I mean, there's going to be plenty of volume to go around. I mean, Jalen Rager, like while he's one of the, to me, he was my like wide receiver one, wide receiver two coming out of this class. But still, we can't expect him to walk into a 20, 21% target share. No. I mean, I can see around 15%, but still, I mean, Ertz is there. Goddard is there. Alshon Jeffrey is still there. We want to see if J.J. Ar- Arthago Whiteside is going to make a second year leap. I mean, there's still plenty of passing volume to go around. And I think Boston Scott can take a hold of that. Yeah, so all right, let's finish up running backs here and, and, and give us some of your fades. Uh, fades for me, uh, one guy that I just, for some reason, I can't seem to bring myself to draft, uh, Leonard Fournette in the early rounds. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I mean, I was I, I was like, I was like, kind of into him last season. Uh, I still think that his, I, th- I think people still knock him for being a one-dimensional back, even though he wound up catching, I think, like 70, tar- 70 targets like last season. It was quite targets. a bit. It was 100 targets, yeah, but he caught like 70-something oh of them. Yeah, it was insane. That's right, yeah, that's, that's which is crazy. ridiculous. Yeah. Which, I mean, but still, I mean, we're, we're talking about them now. I mean, they've switched. I mean, Minshew is now in charge, but they've added another wide receiver to the mix in LaVisca right. Chenault. Chris they brought in yeah. they brought in another tight end like uh who they bring in uh they brought in tyler eifert uh yeah. so from from the Bengals. so they bring in like more pass catchers so that might take away from his snap share they've in they he was on the trading block before the draft so they're ready to move on from him at what point are they out of playoff contention and we want to see more and they want to see more of raquel armstead or anybody else that they currently have there it's entirely possible. Yeah. It's hard for me to get behind his second, third round ADP uh, just because the way that the team has consistently indicated that they're just ready to move on from him. Oh, yeah, they didn't pick up his fifth year option. I, I, yeah. I, I wasn't laughing at you when you said that. I'm laughing with you, uh, hopefully, because I'm in a little uh, Twitter debate. Uh, me and another writer of Fantasy Six Pack randomly, he jumped in with me. Uh, we're debating with a couple of guys, uh, uh, guys, uh, one's a girl, uh, about Leonard Fournette being valued below Joe Mixon and why. And we're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, oh, this shouldn't I can't, be a question at this it. point. No, I'm like, yeah. this shouldn't be a question at this point. Who in God's name thinks that Fournette's going to catch even close to where he gets to? Anyway, you can go. You can watch. You can go read the feed. I'm sure it's. You can find all of them on my Twitter. Uh, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, no, it's thank funny. you. It is funny. <laughs> I'm just like I stopped responding. I'm like, Ugh, this is worse than nah. talking to some of the people you know I on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, if I'm wrong, I mean, I'll definitely be wrong, and I'll 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 hold yeah, that L. Hey. But for for me, it's just it's like as it's about opportunity cost, right? And if you're taking Leonard Fournette, like who are you passing up on? You're passing up on, I mean, even though he switched teams, I mean, Melvin Gordon, with how much the Broncos paid him, I mean, now he walks into a better situation. Who else are you like? Who else are you passing up? Chris Carson. I mean, Chris Carson, even though, I mean, there still are some injury concerns, but he is the alpha in the Seattle backfield. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's opportunity cost involved when taking a guy like Leonard Fournette. And I would say, arguably, both of those guys have better situations than him. So, why do it? Why put yourself there? Totally agree. You got any more fades or move on to wide receivers? 
Um, I think that's about it. I mean, I'm well, the other only one that I do have questions on, and this is more for the early round stuff is Devin Singletary. Uh, I mean, with them drafting Zach Moss, Josh yeah, Allen is still there. Devin Singletary one. is still going. I still see him in like the fourth ish round, fourth, fifth round. I, I just can't see it when they were still giving Frank Gore like goal line carries last oh, season. They said they want to give Zach Moss like 50 50 yeah. split. Yeah, like, really? Uh, it's not sounding great. I know it's all yeah. coach speak, but still. That's not the coach speak you want to hear. <laughs> no, no. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm kind of, I've, I've been off on him for a little bit. I mean, if you want to have him again, if you do a, a running back heavy approach, and let's say you like, if you just hammer running back for let's say even the first four picks, and Devin Singletary is your running back four, okay, fine. But if he's your running back two or three, that's you've injected quite a bit of risk that I just don't see him even meeting that fourth or fifth round value. You know, you just made me think of some one more question before we go to wide receivers. Yeah. What what about handcuffing within best ball? Oh, that's actually a really good point. And uh stack cuffing, uh, which I've heard it called uh, by Todd Burroughs at Todd from PA, I believe is his Twitter handle yeah, nowadays. I know the guy. Um <laughs> yeah. Uh so he actually he turned me on to that. This might have been a couple seasons ago. Where, yeah, depending on the cost of the running backs it, and also their situation, obviously, it can be advantageous for you to do that. So let's say if you were to get, um, let's see, what's a good one off the top of my head? Oh, the, we were talking about the Los Angeles Rams. Right. So let's say since both uh, Cam Akers and let's say Malcolm Brown, both of them, I mean, they, are, they could be a part of the rushing game uh, and they both catch passes out of the backfield. Given their cost at ADP, is it possible that both of them wind up having like at least enough value to meet their ADP cost or outkicking their ADP cost? It's entirely possible. Malcolm Brown could outkick his what 18th round value just just given the fact that if they don't like Daryl Henderson, he doesn't come along well. He has another injury. He becomes the RB two because he was used that way in years past. It's entirely possible. Uh, let's say. Chris Carson and Rashad Penny, even though Rashad Penny is likely to start the year on the pup, given their massive delta in ADP, you could draft Chris Carson. You can grab Rashad Penny later, assuming if he was healthy and we knew he was healthy because we know how much Seattle loves to run. It's possible for you to do that. But it all comes down to cost. I mean, if you're trying to draft, let's say if this was two, three seasons ago, and you were trying to uh, draft like Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara together, you're not getting any value right. out of that. That's it, the it's, pair I was yeah. thinking of all, immediately. Oh. Yeah. I mean, but that's mm-hmm. if you had done that before they were hot, sure. But now, since everyone's in, uh, well, one, they don't play together anymore. But well, two, right. since everybody, that, since that's a popular pick, that'd be harder for you to actually get any value out of drafting both of them. So it's really about one telling yourself a story if those two running backs can meet or exceed their value. And also two, what is the opportunity cost required to get both of them? It's yeah, possible. I mean, even but yeah. now though, with that New Orleans backfield, like getting Kamara and Murray, I that's mean, not bad. This, I don't think as bad as Murray's 37. I mean, like eh, even if he only plays like four weeks for real, it's like you're passing up on guys like, uh, he's Coleman. going around. <laughs> let's see. Latavis Murray is going around. Tariq Cohen, Zach Moss, yeah. Alexander Madison, and Tony Pollard. I'd be okay with it. <laughs> I kind of would be okay with that as well. Where I could yeah. see Especially myself, to, I could I could tell myself a story based off the cost as to how I can get all of the uh, running back touchdowns, mm-hmm. like for like for New uh, for New Orleans. It's possible. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fine with me. All right, let's move on to wide receivers. Mm-hmm. JJ, take it away. All right. So. Uh, <clears throat> You may have heard this question before, but how many <laughs> do you prefer to draft? Uh, so with wide receivers, uh, like we mentioned earlier, because it is a PPR format. Uh, so if it's five to six running backs, I would say seven to eight wide receivers. And that's on fan ball. If it's uh, six, seven or eight running backs, let's say seven, eight, nine wide receivers on FFPC. And uh, based on the um, the research that I'd done on roster construction, I, all, I even saw a couple of uh roster constructions that had 10 wide receivers that seems like the extreme amount but i would say somewhere around like seven eight nine that that's about like where you want to be at and again same approach or similar approach to running backs it all depends on when you're drafting them so i wouldn't just blanket statement say that yes just draft eight wide receivers and then you're good that's it so just the first eight rounds just draft wide receivers and then you've won your league it's not how it works 
It's yeah. more about the draft capital that you spent in order to get them, the opportunity costs that you used in order to get them. Have you complemented your roster well enough that if you're strong at wide receiver, you're also strong at running back and tight end, and then you pick up a quarterback as value falls to you? That's really what it's about. And most of what I found in my research is that trying to go for these like overboard type uh, roster constructions early, like first four picks running back or first four picks wide receiver doesn't really work out as much as we think, because again, we're, we're missing out on good players in the early rounds. So trying to have a balanced approach. So in the first five or six rounds, two running backs, four wide receivers, three running backs, three wide receivers, mm-hmm. uh, two running backs, three wide receivers and a tight end somewhere in there is about where you want to be at, like in terms of building an optimal roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the, uh, uh, the other things I thought was pretty interesting in in the article was, you know, most popular uh, FFPC winning early round constructions rounds one through six that, that from last year, and it just showed the chart basically with the the percentage of winning lineups, and the top percentage at nineteen and a half is three running backs, two receivers, one tight end, and those first six rounds, you drop down the next two winning percentages have three receivers. Um, and, and you drop a whole five points or 5%, mm-hmm. um, you know, for, for your winning lineups. I thought that was pretty crazy that if you don't have that third running back, um, you know, you're, you're dropping a, a lot. And even if you do, but you don't have the tight end then you're dropping another 2%. So it was pretty crazy to, to, to see that stat jumping out. Um, yeah, and I thought that was kind of odd too. And I was I wanted to dig into that a bit more and see if it was specific players that was driving it. Because a lot of what people were doing, especially last season, was that like if basically if you drafted uh, Christian McCaffrey in your league, you won. If you drafted yeah. Christian McCaffrey and then like you got like the Mar Jackson in the 11th, 12th, or 13th round, you definitely won. Yeah. So I, I wanted to see how much of those rosters were affected by guys that were just like clear league winners. And I need to go back and take a look at that because to me, that did seem odd. Like if you just yeah. switch the numbers around just slightly, I mean, you're dropping a pretty significant amount. And I wanted to see if that was caused by maybe one or two players versus it just being kind of a blanket trend. And I need to get back to that. Yeah, but no, it's still interesting, though. I mean, I think it falls in line with kind of how I think. Like, I'm a big roster construction guy. Like, I, I'm in other, like, uh, I'm in baseball dynasty league, same way. Like, people try to hit me up, and, and, they, and they offer me trades that value for value, I win. You know, they're trading mm-hmm. a good outf- outfielder for a, a, a fairly decent second baseman. But, hey, the second baseman isn't as good. But I go, you know what? I've got I've got six, six outfielders that I like. I've got – one second baseman that I like, and you're taking him. I can't give you him. Roster yeah. construction matters to me big time, and it's why I've won that. League oh yeah, three out of the four years it's existed, and so like it, it. Roster. When I saw this article, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like it wasn't just that you were at the top of the list of the Google chart when I <laughs> <laughs> when I when I searched for best ball stuff. It was that this article like hit home to me because this is a big thing to me. Like people want to just talk about draft for value, draft for value, draft for value, draft the best players. That doesn't always work. You have to draft a good team. Right. You have to take a stance somewhere, right? I mean, you have to, at some point in your, in your draft, especially in the first like five or six rounds, where are you going to find value? I mean, are you just expecting DJ Moore to be there in like the fourth round and just have this massive value on guys? It's just, it's just not going to happen. Nope. Yeah, so yeah. you have to take a stance on like taking these players, and then after that, it's it really the value comes. I've normally seen it around like the seventh or after the sixth, seventh round. That's where people start to dive into narrative street. That's where you start seeing those guys like, all right, well, Keyshawn Vaughn, since he got drafted at Tampa Bay, and the coach said that uh, you know Bruce Arians loves that guy. He compared him to Westbrook. I mean, he's going to, you know, Rojo is dead. He's going to be playing Mm -hmm. with Tom Brady. Um, He's better in pass protection anyway, or he might not be. Who knows? But he's playing with Tom Brady. It's going to be great. I'm going to take Keyshawn Vaughn. Okay, you go ahead and do that. I'm just going to take, you know, I'll just take Damien Williams. You go ahead and take Keyshawn, and then we'll be cool. (laughs) But it's just that's where value comes into play, more towards the middle to late rounds because – People are Absolutely. talking themselves into stories, reading the latest Rotor World blurbs, and just firing off of that. Yep. Absolutely agree. Yeah. 
So uh, I think we pretty much covered the next one as far as when you like to draft the guys. So uh, let's just jump right into the sleepers and value you guys that, that you have for wide receiver. So in the middle-ish rounds, a guy like Preston Williams uh, is a guy that I'm tr- I'm trying to draft. Like one because I thought he showed up quite well with the Miami Dolphins uh, last season as an undrafted guy, but also because I think that we've we've been waiting so long for Devonte Parker to break out so that when it happened last season. He he gets like he pole vaults into this like the upper echelon of wide receivers for this season, and to me that makes no sense. I mean, we we saw what happened, like what had to happen in order for Devonte Parker to have this breakout season. And don't get me wrong, I mean their final game, I mean he did dog walk Stefan Gilmore around the like around that field in their last game, so he he played he did play well. But am I gonna take him over like Tyler Lockett? I have a problem with that. Like it's 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 hard for me to now just say that. Well, because now Ryan Fitzpatrick is back, we don't know if uh, Tua is going to play. Uh, Mike Gesicki's coming on. Preston Williams is coming back. Uh, they drafted another. I mean, they brought in. Um, so they bring in Jordan Howard and Matt Breda, who both. I mean, they're not pass catchers, so it doesn't seem to me. It doesn't seem like they're going to be. They're going to try and force a pass heavy game script. So what are we doing? So I would rather take the guy that's going late and a part of the attached to at least Ryan Fitzpatrick for all of his faults. He's not that bad of a quarterback. At least he's gunslinger enough yeah. that Preston Williams can recoup some value for where he's going. So I'd much rather take him or Mike Gusecki once we get to tight ends, than try and like overdraft Devonte Parker. So he's one guy that I like in the middle to uh, middle rounds, uh, late rounds. Um, Alan Lazard sticks out to me yeah. because the Packers, <laughs> for some reason, still haven't uh, still haven't drafted another wide receiver to help uh, Aaron Rodgers, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, but I mean, for as much talk as Rodgers had about Lazard towards hey, the end of last season, <laughs> I mean, if you if you can't get a hold of Devontae Adams, who is the clear alpha, then why not take the wide receiver two in that offense? And I'll yeah. take Lazard. Yeah, yeah, I don't hate it. Yeah. All right, so on the flip side then, who uh, who are you looking at fading this year? Uh, I mean, guys that I'm fading at their particular cost. DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, I knew that was I, coming. I can't do it. I just, I can't do it. I can't. It's not because of his situation. I mean, Kyler Murray's a good quarterback. Uh, and he got the, I mean, rookie of the year. I mean, okay. But, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, he has survived off of, what, 150 targets Massive per season? target share. Right. Yes. I mean, we're talking, I mean, wide receiver one volume is typically around a 24, 25, 26% target share. DeAndre Hopkins had 29 to 30% for most of his time in, in Houston. Get that this year. Wow. Yeah, there's no, no way. way. I mean, it's very hard for me to tell myself a story as to how he gets to that switching teams and now playing with not one but two legitimate wide receivers alongside of him like for the entire season yep. not just like will fuller for one and two five about games drake actually catching pass out of the backfield exactly so, yeah. so this this is a different <clears throat> offense like can i can i can i can i pencil in 110 targets for deandre hopkins 120 targets for hopkins sure but I can't see 150, 160 yeah, like he no, has in years past. I 100% agree with you. I knew that one was coming. I was hoping it would. <laughs> so I, 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 I have to, I have to pass. I mean, I would much rather, at his cost, I would much rather take, um, uh, like we were talking about earlier. I would take Tyree Kill. At yep. least his highs, I would assume, are going to be much higher yeah, than best DeAndre you Hopkins. Deal with it a little more. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's hard for me to get behind that. I think Hopkins is uh, going to be a steady, consistent player. He'll be solid. Um, yeah. Tyreek's going to have the massive and the bad and then the average in between to average mm-hmm. out. But those massive weeks are going to be so much more valuable than Hopkins. And in best ball, that's of, what you want. Yeah, like the, you the you want those peak middle. weeks. Yep. I mean, yeah, that's what you really want. And we already talked about Devontae Parker. Can't do it. <laughs> Can't do it. Totally agree. Uh, another guy yeah. that I keep seeing people like pick up later just because I don't know he had like cool tweets and he was wearing like cool stuff uh, during pregame. Uh, Miko Hardman for the Kansas City Chiefs. What? Come on. <laughs> I mean, I I love the tweets, man, and I was all about spending up for him. Well, not spending up for him because it didn't cost a lot in DFS last season. 
But still, I mean, it was every week that we were expecting something big to happen. And then it was Sammy Watkins, six for 150 and two touchdowns. And just, <laughs> and now Sammy Watkins is back. Uh, I mean, Demarcus Robinson is still there. I mean, there's just a slew of wide receiver two and wide receiver three options in Kansas City that, I mean, as much as we want that breakout to happen, I, I mean, you're not you're not spending a ton on Miko Hardman. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's there's not a lot of risk in a what 14th, 15th round pick. I understand. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, I would much rather take a shot on a guy like, let's say, uh, I could see myself trying to draft John Ross. I mean, if you want to buy into the narrative that it's his final season on his contract, he was actually a legitimate part of that offense for a time like last season. Uh, so I could see myself taking a chance on him. Uh, I could see myself taking a chance on Tyrell Williams, his last year on his contract, even if yeah. for as many pass catchers as Las Vegas has added to that roster. I, I mean, he's better than Ross. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I could tell myself a story about how most of those guys at least have a path to targets over a guy like Hardman. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, I, I like totally that. agree with that. Yeah. So no, I, I like I like all of those uh, all those fades or all of those as fades, I guess. Um, so <clears throat> let's finish things up here. Tight ends. So again, just kind of your preference. How many do you draft? That I know you mentioned the FPPC or FFPC is the tight end premium. So maybe it's totally different. Mm-hmm. I would be curious to hear. Uh, so with that, it's either so on Fanball, yeah, two to three depending on when they're drafted, uh, FFPC three to four. And me, I still can't bring myself to draft. Uh, I have reached for, uh, I have grabbed like Travis Kelsey early. Um, Kittle, man, for some reason, as much as like, he had the highest target share in San Francisco, like of, of all of the pass catchers. I think he had like a almost a wide receiver one-ish like type target share, like mm-hmm. 24-ish percent like last yeah. season. Uh, I mean, more than Debo Samuel, Emmanuel Sanders, get out of here. Don't even care. I mean, there was no other pass catcher in that offense that had a greater target share like than George Kittle. But for some reason, I still can't bring myself to do it. That's my own personal well, bias. So, I'll have to get over it. So even with the fact that in your article, the the number one winning percentage was three running backs, two receivers, and one tight end. And you got to assume that one of those tight ends was a Kittle, was a Kelsey. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Still didn't sway you. And number two had a tight end, fourteen. And a half yeah, percent. but that's in the first six rounds. Okay. So I could still wind up getting a guy like Hunter Henry, Evan Ingram. Yeah. I mean, th- those guys are still there in the first six rounds, and I could talk myself into a story where, at least in the first, let's say five picks, I walk away with uh, two decent running backs, two decent wide receivers, and then I throw on top of that. Uh, Hunter Henry, Eric, uh, Evan Ingram. Uh, if I, if you really believe in Tyler Higby, like redoing some of what he did last season, I mean, that's possible. Yeah. Now, do yeah, they have? They don't have the same upside as Kittle, Kelsey, and even Ertz to some degree. One hundred percent agree. You mean you got to go to Kittle and Kittle and um, Kelsey like one two, like one of the yeah. first, one of the first second rounds. So I I I yeah. I, I agree with you. I just kind of wanted to. Oh I'm yeah, and I, I go against like it, for me, it's like I do the research, and then once I get into the drafts, it's like I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's like I don't, I don't want to do I'm that. The same way. I, yeah. <laughs> nope. Like I, I, I want, I want DJ Moore here. Yeah, I don't want to draft George Kittle here. I don't value like, tight like, ends as much as people, other people do. I never have. Yeah, I never it, it's will. just that with the fragility at that yep. position. If you're not drafting those high end guys, I mean, gosh, I mean, you're you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Like when you're looking, when you're staring down, Greg Olson, uh, I mean, David and Joku, OJ Howard. Uh, I mean, some of those guys. Are, I mean, even if you want to go even deeper than that, Jordan Akins. Uh, I mean, it's wow. you're you're really <laughs> you're really digging deep, and it gets pretty deep at uh, FFPC when it comes to tight end drafting. So if you are targeting three to four. Uh, if you get Ooh. two within the first, I would say, 10 rounds, one within the first six for sure, uh, two within the first 10, uh, and then try and, again, try and tell yourself a story as to how, I don't know, Cameron Brait winds up getting you a few good weeks. Hey, you could have okay. gotten Gusecki super late last could. year, I'm sure. Yeah, Gusecki, absolutely. <laughs> he is on my he's on my value <laughs> list for guys that I'm targeting this season, absolutely. I got into, well, I didn't get into a fight. 
uh, but I was uh, I was in a mock draft with uh, JJ Zacharyson. He took him like oh, the, the pick right before me, and I had to wind up taking TJ Hawkinson the round later. Oh, uh, but yeah, he's definitely one of those guys that you would want to target. And yeah. if he's my tight end three, oh, absolutely, Money. I love that. Yeah, Gronk. Yes, <laughs> Gosh. Uh, anyway, all right. So you basically told us where you like to draft them to. So sleepers values. If you didn't already give them away. Uh, any any others than what you mentioned already with Gusecki? No, because I think the cat's kind of out of the bag on a lot of those guys. I yeah. mean, even guys that we were thinking uh, might go a little bit later, like let's say like Hayden Hurst, Blake Jarwin, Johnu Smith, Ian Thomas. I mean, everybody knows that they can just they don't even, you don't even have to squint like looking at the offenses. How you can tell yourself a story, how they can walk into right. you know seventy eighty targets like in each of their rosters. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I've trapped like for Johnu Smith in particular. I want to say when it was uh, April, I was walking out of drafts with so many like Tannehill Johnu stacks. Like it was ridiculous because I just I see Tannehill as one of those value picks at quarterback. I see Smith as one of those like tight end two, tight end three values because mm-hmm. everybody was going for Goddard. Everybody's going for Higby. Everybody's going for uh, even guys like, uh, I mean, Austin Hooper still. I mean, so they were pushing down that value and it's just, all right, I'll take Johnny Smith as yeah. my tight end too. Absolutely. Cool. I'll, I'll take it. That's all fine right, by so me. Some guys are fading besides the Kelsey and Kittles. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm still fading Rob Gronkowski. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can't. I can't do it either. No, I'm not doing it. I don't. Yeah. So, I mean, well, for I just think it's, it's such a. It, I mean, it it makes complete sense that this is what's happening, but I, I just I don't I don't know I'm not buying into him this year. It, it it's going to go one of two ways: either he is the Gronk of two three seasons ago, or he is just a flat out bust. Yeah. Like I just can't I can't see it I can't see any middle ground to this at all. Well, Either he comes back and haven't... he's bulked back up and he has you know healed through his CBD oil that he's been you know oh promoting or whatever since he's been out <sighs> and he's completely pain free and he just completely mows down the league and Tom Brady passes him and he gets like ten plus touchdowns. Otherwise, his like he's going as the tight end nine. I. I I the can't. Other thing with Gronk is like when he was in New England, right? Like, let's be honest, he was the first or second passing target on that offense. Uh huh. For years. now, he's the third? now he's the third, at least third, right? Yeah. Like, I just don't see it happening. He's older. We saw how skinny he was, and yes, he will walk back up. I get it, but I don't. I don't buy it. I don't buy it at yeah. all. I, I'm. I will draft him as a mid tight end two in. Best balls at best. So you guys can take him to the tight end one. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't it. do it. I mean, even even still, I mean, like his. So he was able to make most of his hay on the fact that he was running those seam routes that would get him like ten plus yards down the field. Can he still do that? Is, or I mean, are are people wrecked. really just banking on the fact that they're going to bring him in in the red zone and he just caps off an eighty yard drive with like a ten yard bunny touchdown? I think it's a little bit of that. Like I just I don't understand it. I, I really don't know. Um, like his average depth of target was twelve point seven yards in twenty eighteen. He can't do that. No, he's he's not doing that no. now. No, that's that's pretty deep for tight end i feel like yeah i i can't see him still doing that in 2020 i want to ask you because you brought this guy up what what's uh what is austin hooper's adp because he's 10th on fantasy pros rankings right now yeah he is going as the tight end nine in ffpc adp i honestly i still fade him <laughs> i hate him in yeah Cleveland. i hate him in Cleveland. everybody he's getting boosted up because he got like you know nine targets a game or something crazy like that in in atlanta mm-hmm. He's not getting that in Cleveland. There's no chance. I know they had Julio and I know they had Ridley. Cleveland has more people besides that. Like, there's just too many. It's just not going to happen. And in Njoku, there's nobody else. Right. That. So, uh, if they had gotten rid of Njoku, like, maybe, I might have been maybe. more on board. But, yeah. like, you're talking about, I mean, a lot of people are still talking themselves into, well, Kevin Stefanski likes to use two tight end sets. He did that with Irv Smith and Kyle Rudolph when he was in Minnesota. Yeah, but <laughs> did but how did, well did that work out <laughs> right? for Irv Smith and Kyle Rudolph? Not I, I wasn't good. rostering either I one mean, of them, too. Unless you caught the, tight, unless you caught the touchdowns. 
Yeah, I, I wasn't. Well I wasn't really rushing to play I both of them. I think this is more of an NFL type move than it is a fantasy move. Like, not good, not good for yeah. us. But it's great. Well, for and, the team. and also, I mean, uh, a lot of a lot of Austin Hooper's targets. I mean, they came because the Falcons were in negative game scripts for a significant portion of their season. Their defense, I mean, was banged up for most of the season. So 100%. Matt Ryan was having to pass out. Was having to pass quite a bit, and most of his passes, I believe, somewhere between fifty and fifty-five percent of his passes were to the interior, short of the like short middle of the field. Baker Mayfield, like while that is still also his MO to throw to the short middle of the field, they're not going to be in as many negative games for us because their defense is much better than Atlanta's. So how can we expect Austin Hooper to have that same number of targets this season when, one, their team is not going to have as many pass attempts. It's more of a run-first offense than a pass-first offense. Also, they won't be in as many negative games for us because their defense is better. I just don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, except for the fact that they do play in that – North AFC North division and uh, they're going to be behind Pittsburgh and Baltimore at least. Yeah, years, so. been... maybe those, but I don't know, man. It's it's yeah, I I don't like it. Seems so. like a stretch. Yeah. All right, so last quick question here. Just we've mentioned some rookies here and there, but I mean, what is your general thought about rookies in best ball? Like, I feel like they get overhyped, but am I crazy? No, you're not crazy, and I think it depends on what position you're talking about. Like rookie tight ends, absolutely not. Oh, of course. Not. I mean, we already we already know that the tight end position takes is like one of the hardest like to uh, to the acclimate running, to. The running backs are the big ones to get overhyped, and maybe a, a right. handful, a hand, like a small handful of receivers. Yeah, for running backs, it's easier for them to trans transition into the NFL because they're learning schemes that they've probably done most of in college, unless the blocking schemes are completely different and they're going to an offensive system that's much different than what they ran in college. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, draft capital gives us a, a better indication as to how we should treat incoming rookie running backs. So like think of the guys that went in, went in the first round in years past, the Saquons, the Zeeks. Right. I mean, even uh, this past this past year, well, who went in the first round uh, this past year? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, a running back that went in the first round. Oh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire. So, oh, I mean, I a lot of those guys draft, went... Or 2019 draft. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but for most of those guys, uh, the draft capital gives us an indication of how the team wants to use them. So we can at least slot them in for a significant number of touches. Now with Zeke and Saquon, it was easy to see that they were going to wind up being the bell cows in their Nobody offenses. Else there. <laughs> yeah, CEH, obviously a different story, but at least still we can slot him in for a significant part of uh, a significant number of touches in his offense. Not more so than Damian Williams, fingers mm -hmm. crossed, but still a significant number of uh, <laughs> a significant number of touches. Wide receivers, it's different because, like I said earlier, I mean they have to one learn the offense. Two, they're having to go up against like pro corners or pro safeties, which they haven't done yet. And then three, they have to be on time and on target, like with their with their quarterback, which especially this season, which uh, they've also they've extended the virtual offseason for another two weeks because of covid. I mean, with the shortened offseason, it's even harder for me to invest in rookie wide receivers because I've had less time to prepare for, uh, for playing in the pros. Now, we've had we have seen NFL rookies or wide receivers uh, pop in the past we just saw aj brown and dk metcalf like mm -hmm. you know they jumped off the screen but that's two out of the however many wide receivers that were drafted yeah. i mean it it takes a while for that to for the position for them to develop at that position so it's harder for me to invest unless again they're they're absolute freaks like aj brown considered a freak dk metcalf i don't know what steroids that guy's on but <laughs> clearly he's on something but it's just you you have to really talk yourself into some of those guys where I just can't see myself uh, drafting, let's say, Brandon Ayuk has the first round draft capital. Yeah, but, probably not going to happen. But probably not going to happen because, again, if we're looking at how often San Francisco passes, is that really a guy that you want to invest in? Yeah. When George Kittle was there, had the highest target share like in that offense, hard for me to invest in. Jalen Rager, wow. I might be able to invest in that. It's It's possible. I could tell myself a story how Alshon Jeffrey gets hurt. He's older. J.J. Ortega Whiteside, he takes a little bit longer to develop as a wide receiver. They need a better downfield threat. I can see myself investing in somebody like that, but it's I have to wait until the later rounds in order the to do one, that. The one I like more than any of those two you mentioned, that's your Justin Jefferson. Yes. Justin Jefferson. Role. He's got the spot. That's it. Yes. It's his. That's it. Take it. Yes. 
I mean, I, I've argued with, uh, no, I haven't argued with, I agree with the great Peter Howard on the fact that vacated targets are a myth, but in the, the fact that the only other players, wide receivers in Minnesota's offense right now are what, Ola B.C. Johnson, uh, Chad Beebe, that are still on the roster to take over for Steph Diggs. Yeah. It's it's hard for me to see him no not way. walking into a 15 to 20% target share in Minnesota. Yeah. I, I think it, I think vacated targets are more of a myth when they don't bring in somebody to like Right. You know, but it's it's one of those things where they drafted him to obviously replace Diggs. Like that was their guy. Yeah. They wanted that, that seemed him pretty clear. They got him. <laughs> so, yeah, I I want him all day, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's he's probably one of the only rookies in any draft I'll go after this year. Yeah, but like as much hype that went around guys like Jerry Judy, Judy yep. but Jerry Judy's like he's playing alongside Cortland Sutton. He's attached to Drew Locke, yeah. and we still have questions Lamb. about People him. People love Lamb. I'm like this year, no. Yes, yeah, CD. I <laughs> mean, on. as again, he was another prospect I was very high on in the draft process, but he's still competing against Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup. Uh, I mean, he might be a good for NFL purposes. I can see him getting five to 600 yards, maybe Absolutely. a few touchdowns. But again, is he somebody that you're like rushing out to draft? Uh, I might leave that one Dynasty, on, the, on the board for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, but no. Yeah. So. Yeah. Fantasy. I mean, it's good for Dak, but not really yes. good for his yes, like absolutely. fantasy prospects in his rookie season. Oh. All right, man. Well, that's all we got. Uh, let's uh, remind everybody where they can find you um all over the internet oh you can find me on twitter at chris allen ffwx most of my stuff during the off season will be over at four for four that's where i do most of my off season research i've been doing a lot of best ball obviously <laughs> uh but as i mentioned like before we started talking one of my big things that i've been fascinated with for the past few years have been like research into weather and how it affects uh, nfl games Check out some of the uh, past work that i've done but i have a couple of uh, updates to that series that i'll be doing uh, this year, nice. uh, so I've been I've been working with John Paulson. Uh, he's been interested in that work, and actually during the this past season, uh, on Sunday morning we would go back and forth like, oh, it's going to rain here. The wind's going to be like 18 miles an hour here. What does that mean? So I'm setting up a study that I'm going to be uh, I'll be running the numbers for him, and uh, so check that out. Like when that drops, it'll probably be within the next month or so. Uh, and then once the season starts, uh, I'll be doing stuff over at Number Fire. I uh, do most of my in-season work like between there and four for four. And then of course for dynasty stuff, like during the off season, doing video content over with a uh, DLF. Good stuff. Man. Awesome. Uh, great. Everywhere. Great repertoire of, uh, of work there. So good stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you guys don't follow him already, man, definitely follow him on Twitter. It's uh, it's, it's worth it. He's got some g- great content out there. Uh, Chris, great having you on, man. This was very informative informational so uh we will have to thanks for having later. me fellas anytime yeah yeah man absolutely. very very good info and i uh, enjoyed it thanks a lot hi right, man see you later <laughs> have a good night all right aj um that's all i got uh, all i gotta say is uh i'm wearing i'm wearing the the scott fishbowl shirt praying that we get in this year because uh it's not looking good so far <laughs> uh <laughs> I know yeah, I mean, it I was, know, I it was pretty late bring... last year when, when my invite came yeah. through. I actually just went through my email to just check and see, make sure I still had it. And like, okay, where are my Scott Fish emails getting filtered to? Are they coming yeah, straight to the inbox? No are they idea. going somewhere else? What's the deal? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, man. I've usually had mine by now. And uh, I know last year, you know, randomly at the last second, he was like, hey, give me your list of all your fancy football writers. Let me, let me check it. And I sent him everybody and like, Eight of you got an invite. I was like, "Holy crap!" Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't know. John John Lepresto already got his. Now he's been a finalist twice, so don't doubt that invite at all. Um, but yeah. I'm still hoping I get mine. I have a lot of fun in that league, man. Even though you know I've made the conference finals every year, I've been in it for five years or whatever it is. Um, so that's been kind of painful not to make the finals at least one of those times, but. Yeah, uh, I I just have a good time drafting and meeting all everybody and just contributing to the the charity that they do. Like every every single year, I throw some money at the charity. Um, not a yeah. lot. I mean, I don't have a ton to give, but uh, it's you know it's 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 whatever. I, I give what I can. Um, buy the t shirts, you know, things like that. So yeah. um, I'm just hoping that some of us get in. I, I but I also know this guy's trying to give a bunch of people that haven't had a chance in the past uh, that have tried to get in many, many times in the past. Yeah. Um, and just haven't and haven't gotten ever in. gotten in. So I, I I get it. 
I'll be a little sad, but I'm not going to be mad. So Scott, wow, you're probably yeah. never going to listen to this, but don't worry about me, man. I'm not going to blast you on Twitter like all these other, like a bunch of these other people that have so far. So do your thing, Take man. Out. It's it's for a good cause. I'll still I'll still uh, I'll still throw some money at it. So absolutely. All right. Well, that's all I've got. AJ, you got anything else? No, I'm good, man. All right. Let's close it out. Peace. All right.